You know, as we, as we respond to the Lord in worship in that moment, what is it that God wants to do in you? What is it, you know, it's easy to sing songs and, 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 and read words off a screen, but what is it that God wants to do in you for you to trust Him, to take new steps of faith, to, to take risks for God? See, that's what he's calling us to do. And I just want to pray that prayer over you right now. Lord, I just pray that you would uh, increase our faith. I pray, God, that you would, God, help us to believe that you can do anything. And, Lord, we believe that. We trust that. And right now I just pray that, Lord, as we respond to your word, as we open your word, God, that you would just speak in power and uh, draw us closer to you, increase our faith. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Thank you guys for being here. All right. Man, it's so good to see you guys and uh, grateful that you are here to worship with us today. Uh, we're continuing a series uh, called uh, Relentless Faith. And over these last weeks, we've been talking about what does it mean to have relentless faith? What does it mean to have biblical faith? Even when we say the word faith, right? When we hear that word, we all nod our head and say, yeah, we should do that. We like that, and, and we, we all agree that, you know, faith is a good thing. But so often when we use that word, are we actually living by faith? Are we saying yes to God and what he calls us to do? Are, are we trusting him with what we've been entrusted with? Are we responding to his word with our yes? You see, it's easy to use the word and talk about faith, but are we actually trusting God and taking those steps of faith? So often in our lives, we, 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 we lose that. Something happens, difficulty takes place, and, and our faith is weakened, and our trust in God slips away, and we find ourselves kind of lost, drifting, wondering, where did my faith go? Why have I stopped trusting God? I don't know if you've ever been in one of those situations in your life, but maybe you find yourself there today, and I, I just want to encourage you. I want to increase your faith. I want you to remember who your God is and that He is trustworthy that you can trust Him, that you can be faithful to Him. I'll give you an example, right? So, this is a chair, all right? Does everybody agree that's a chair? Okay, we believe it's a chair. I look at it and I believe it's a chair. It's got four legs, I've seen a chair before. I, I believe that it's a chair. And this is the way many of us are when it comes to our faith in God. It's called what I'll describe today for our for our service, I'll call it observational faith. We observe the chair. We believe it's a chair, kind of the way we do with God, right? We observe that Jesus is the Son of God, and we would even, we would even say that we believe he, he died on the cross and that He's the way to heaven, but, but do we actually put our faith in Him? You see, the Bible says in the book of James, even the demons believe Jesus is the Son of God. So think about that. That's pretty crazy, right? They believe, they mentally acknowledge who he is, but that doesn't mean they have faith in him. And just acknowledging something mentally, just believing it is true, doesn't change your life. What changes my life is when I put my trust in it. Kind of like this chair. I can tell you all day that I believe it's a chair, but until I sit in the chair, and all 160 pounds of, that I weigh, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> that's you're really kind. I didn't get laughs in the other services. All the people at the Alico campus didn't laugh at me either. Uh, no, all 200 and something pounds of me sitting in this chair, I fully trusted all that I am in this chair. I've, I've, I've put my full trust in the chair. You see, and that's where some of us are spiritually. You're observing Jesus. You like some of the benefits of Jesus, and you look at Jesus and say, oh, I believe that's true. But are you putting your trust in him? Is all your weight on who he is and what he did for you through his sacrificial work on the cross and his resurrection. You see, to have relentless faith isn't just to observe it to be true. It's to trust in it, put all your weight in it, and remain in it. To remain in the seat. To remain close to Jesus. Think about the words of Jesus. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. It's about remaining in him, trusting in him, depending on him. Most of the time when life happens, we go through difficulties. And we I was talking to somebody in the lobby between this, this service and the last service. And they've been going through a lot of 
challenges. And it's in those moments, that's where our faith is actually revealed. It's not when everything's easy and life is good and you're not up against any opposition or loss or challenge. Faith is revealed when I'm up against it, when I'm facing opposition, when I have difficulty, when I have hard challenges in front of me. That's what reveals authentic biblical faith, not just me observing something to be true. Oh yeah, I believe it's a chair. Oh yeah, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Have you trusted in Him? Are you trusting Him? Is your faith action? You see, this is kind of, I guess, the big truth for the message, and that is faith is when my belief and my actions collide, when they come together. That's biblical faith, right? It's not just observing something to be true, but it's when I actually live out what I claim with my lips. Now, some of you are probably thinking in your mind, yeah, I tried that faith thing, and I said yes to God, and when I did it, a lot of problems came my way. Everything didn't work out the way that I thought it would. I I faced opposition, and there was difficulty. And so I'm afraid to do that again, right? I'm, I'm, I'm scared of that. And here's the thing I just want to challenge you with is sometimes when you take steps of faith, of course there's going to be challenge. Of course there's going to be opposition. But so often the reason that we miss what God's doing is we have the wrong perspective. We're only thinking about what it does for us or how it benefits us, not how it brings God glory. And when we have that perspective, oftentimes we miss and we walk away from something thinking that we lost. But really what happened was God grew us, God changed us, God challenged us. You see, God is way more concerned with shaping my character and developing me into his follower than he is the benefit for my life on how I perceive how I should be blessed and everything should go my way. And sometimes when that happens, we begin to live without faith. We begin to forget what God's word says, like in Romans 8, 28, where it says, all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I can know that God sees the big picture, I only see a small part, and that all things are going to work together in my life. He's working things that I don't even see and that don't make sense to me for my good and for his glory so he can develop me into who he's called me to be. But so often in these moments, right, fear gets the best of us. We take that step of faith, we're about to do it, we're about to trust God in a big way, and then we stand in front of Him like, man, this is too big, this is too hard, this is too challenging. For many of us this week alone, there was something that you were going to do, and a spiritual step you were going to take to trust God more, to take a step of faith, and as you started to take it, it became too difficult, it was too big, God's not big enough. And we shrink back and we live in fear, but I'm reminded of 2 Timothy 1.7 where it tells me, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Can I just be honest with you guys and confess today that too often in my life, my prayers are way too small. My prayers are way too small. I forget the God that I follow. I forget the God of the Bible. And I start to pray small, weak, little prayers, forgetting who God is and how great He is. What about in your life? What kind of prayers are you praying? What kind of steps are you taking? What are you believing God for? Do you have an observational faith where you're just looking at Jesus and saying, Oh, this is nice. I get to go to heaven and Jesus provides all this stuff for me. Or are you living biblical faith, trusting in Him? Today we're going to look at an amazing story in the Old Testament. And we're going to look at this guy in the Bible. His name is Joshua. And one of the things I love about Joshua is his incredible faith to trust God for the impossible. His belief that God could do anything. And when I read his story and think about his life, it really, really challenges me, and I believe it will you as well. Now, before we look at Joshua chapter 10, I just want to kind of give you the background, because oftentimes when you read the Bible, if you'll understand the context and the, the background of what's happening, it makes it make way more sense. So Joshua was a guy who was born into slavery. Okay, He was literally born a slave in Egypt. He was an Israelite. And for 400 years, the Israelites had been enslaved in Egypt, great suffering and difficulty under the the authority and the power of Pharaoh. And God raised up this incredible leader known as Moses. You ever seen the movie? Heard the story, right? We've all seen that. We've heard that. Maybe you read it in the Bible or saw it on TV. And, And God raised up this incredible leader, Moses, and Moses 
was called to go to Pharaoh to bring freedom and to see the Israelites set free from slavery. So he goes uh, to, to Pharaoh and he says, listen, you need to let God's people go because if you don't, there's going to be a problem. And of course, Pharaoh says, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And of course, if you know the story, ten plagues, ten difficult things come upon the Egyptians until finally so much suffering came upon them that Pharaoh lets the Israelites go and Joshua is one of those people. He's one of those slaves. And so here this young man sees God do a miracle, set his people free. He, he's broken free from slavery. Not only that, but Joshua experienced God parting the Red Sea. Now think about that for a minute. Here's a guy who's been a slave his whole life, and now he sees God do this incredible work. The sea, the Red Sea is parted. He walks on dry land. He experiences this incredible miracle of God. He gets to the other side. The enemy is coming after them, and God crushes their enemy with the waters of the Red Sea as it would come over the Egyptian army. And the people of God find themselves free at last on the other side of slavery, set free by the power of God. You see, that's really our story. The story of the Israelites being set free, the Exodus as it's known, is really our story. You see, we are slaves to sin. And that sin entangles us and there's no way that we can get away from the power of that sin and death that twist us up. But God, through His incredible grace, sent His Son, Jesus Christ, and just like the Red Sea was parted, Jesus' blood was shed. And when you pass through the blood of Jesus Christ, you walk through going from a slave to being set free. And you get to the other side and you are free from the power of sin and death that once held you. You are no longer held captive by the power of sin, but you are covered by the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ made new in Him. We see that's the story of the Exodus. These people now are set free. And so they, have, they should have this incredible faith, right? I mean, they just saw God do a miracle. They've been praying for hundreds of years, and now God has come through with this incredible miracle. Well, they get to the other side, and God uses Moses to lead them, and he says, I'm going to lead you to the promised land. And so just like any strategist would do, Moses sends out 12 spies to go evaluate the land. So he sends out the 12 spies, the 12 spies go, and they're looking, and they had heard about this land that God has, had promised. Full of milk and honey, man. It's going to be amazing. There's going to be just all kinds of resource and blessing. It's going to be sweet. It's going to be good. And they go, and the 12 spies begin to evaluate the situation so the Israelites can go where God had promised. Ten of the 12 spies are shaking in their shoes. They are scared to death because what they observe as they're overlooking God's promise is they observe that there are people that are really tall in the land. There's a lot of big people. There's a lot of scary stuff. And they are overwhelmed by fear. And fear would set in their heart. Now, there's two other spies that are with them, Caleb and Joshua. And Joshua are like, no, 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 no. God's big enough. I know that they're big. I know that their army is great. I know it seems impossible, but God just set us free from slavery. God just brought us through the Red Sea. God crushed the greatest army on earth, the Egyptians. He can do this too. Right? He can do this too. But you know what happens, unfortunately. The ten outnumber the two, and their voices spread among the Israelites. The negativity. This is so true in your life. This is so relevant, man. This is so relevant because you've been standing at the edge of God's promise in your life. You've been looking at it. God's about to give it to you. There's going to be blessing. And you start to listen to the voices. God's not big enough. God can't do it. You should give up. You should just take it easy. You should just stay right where you are. And that's exactly what happened with the Israelites. They listened to those voices of the scared ten spies, and they stayed right where they are. And they, they, this is the thing, guys. Because of their fear and their lack of faith, they would spend the next 40 years, 40, if you've lived in your life, you know that's a long time, longer than many of you have lived, and if you've lived longer than that, you know it's, it's a big part of your life, 40 years. Because of their lack of faith, they're wandering in the wilderness. 
That stinks. You've got to imagine Joshua was like, hold up just a minute. I believe we can do it. I believe God will help us. I believe we can take the land. And because of the lack of faith, he gets to join in with 40 years. Sometimes other people's decisions impact your life. But how you respond will determine your destiny. It will ter- determine your future. How does, how does Joshua respond? Does he go cry in the corner and give up? No. Unfortunately, he spends the next 40 years of his life realizing what the lack of faith produced. 40 years go by. Moses is about to die. He's not going to get to go into the promised land. He's not going to get to lead the people. He then lays hands. This is in Deuteronomy 34, verse 9. You, I don't have it on the screen for you, but you can check it out. He lays his hands on Joshua, who's his right-hand man, his second-in-command. And he says, I'm anointing you. You're going to go and take over. And the Bible tells us when he lays hands on him that the Holy Spirit comes and resides in Joshua. Now, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon people for a specific purpose and a specific task to fulfill the purpose of God. Can I just tell you, you've got it way better. You've got it way better. I think we forget this, guys. We forget this. Jesus just doesn't give you a ticket to heaven. Jesus gives you the Holy Spirit of the living God to come and dwell inside of you. And when you trust in Him, His Spirit is put in you for a purpose. And the purpose is to advance the kingdom, to bring the glory to God, to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to take the land that God has promised for His people. Well, check it out. So He lays hands on Him. God fills Him with His Spirit. Now Joshua is... God's anointed man to lead the people into the promised land. And that's exactly what he would do. He would trust God in a great way and he would lead the army of Israel into victory, into the promised land. Now they would face a lot of challenges and a lot of battles. After 40 years of wandering the wilderness, what will his faith be? Well, we read throughout scripture and we learn that his faith is is great and he believes that God can do it even after 40 years and some of you need to hear that today because somebody else made decisions that impacted you and it's weakened your faith and you've forgotten who God is and you need to remember that God is the God of victory God is the God who can break the chains in your life God is the God who can who can give you what he's promised in his word Joshua 10 is one of the amazing stories that we read about his life and so This is one of the amazing victories that the Israelites had. And so I I want us to look at this. But understanding what's happened, who he is in the story, makes this so much more powerful. Joshua 10, verse 7 through 15 says this. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. Can I just tell you something? We need some fighting men. Your children need you to be a fighting man. When men lay down... Children lose. Women lose. Come on, men. Let's go. If you hang around Hope City, you know I talk about this a lot, but that's okay. I'm not looking for a bunch of wimps, a bunch of wusses. Come on. Let's go. Best fighting men. Verse 8. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. Now, isn't that so powerful? In this moment, he's saying, don't be afraid of the enemy. Don't be afraid of the enemy. (laughs) He already experienced the results of that, right? Don't be afraid of them. He said, I have given them into your hand. Not one of them, not one, will be able to withstand you. Verse 9, after an all-night march from Gilgal. I don't know about you, but if I marched all night, I'd be tired. But after an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. Verse 10, I love this. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Haran and cut them down all the way to Azekiah and Machadiah. As they fled before Israel on the road down to Beth Haran and Azekiah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them. Now, you may have something that you're in front of that you're like, man, I just don't think this is possible, but you know God's called you to it. It can be too great, and I just want to remind you, God can make miracles happen. He can throw down hailstones. He can create confusion. He, listen to me guys, Jesus is not just going to win, he's winning. He's winning. 
It may feel like it. You may think, oh, it doesn't seem like. No, he's winning. He's winning. Sometimes we get lost in our little box. He's winning. He uh, uh, hurled down hailstones on them, and more of them died from the hail than was killed by the sword of the Israelites. So when you're in war, and you know, okay, God just sent hail from the sky and killed our enemy more than we did with the sword, you're like, God gets the glory. Not us, God, right? This happens in this moment. Verse 12. This is so good, y'all. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel. Now, this is really important. Joshua doesn't pray this prayer off by himself that nobody can hear and go, okay, I'm going to pray this real soft to you, God, because I don't want anybody to hear this prayer. No, he has full faith in God and who he is, and he declares this prayer to God in front of all of Israel, all the people, and he says something really radical, okay? He's about to declare a radical thing. Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you moon over the valley of Ajalon. Verse 13, so the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. So, there's not enough daylight to finish this battle. God is on our side. He's confusing them. Hell's coming. We're winning. Hey, God, I need you to do us a favor here. We need to finish this war. We need to get this victory. Could you make the sun stop in the sky so we could have enough sunlight to finish this battle? I mean, that literally is his prayer. It is craziness for him to think that God could do such a thing. But the Bible says that the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. Verse 14, there's never been a day like it before or since. A day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Can you just imagine that day? After these people had wandered in the wilderness, many of them born during that time, they'd heard the story of God's great uh, exodus that he had given them from slavery. They had experienced the incredible work of God providing for them while they wandered in the wilderness. But now they had to have faith to trust God to do what only God could do. And God did an incredible thing. He literally stopped the sun in the sky And it changed the destiny of a nation. You see, God wants to change the destiny of your family. He wants to change the destiny of our church. He wants to give us what he's promised to us, to build his kingdom, to bless your family. The question is, do we believe that God can? What do our prayers sound like? Hey, God, I just need to get through today. I just got got to get through it. Or are we praying, God, I believe you're going to do this. I have full faith that you can. I'm going to trust you. And it doesn't just come out of my mouth, but my feet follow what I claim with my mouth. You see, that's, that's what the people of God here did. That's what Joshua did. In the same way that God stopped the sun, for the army of Israel, God can make the sun stop in your life too. He can make a way when there seems no way. He can bring breakthrough in your, in your family when it seems like it can't happen. He can restore what seems to be broken. That is who our God is. And from day one when we started this church, we have full faith and belief that God's going to do a great work. We're not here to play church. I, that makes me want to throw up. I have no interest in that. We have a mission. We have a calling. We're called by God to do His work. We've been called to represent Him. What is it that God wants to do in us the same way God, don't miss this, the same way God spoke to the Israelites. And remember what he told them when they had crossed the Red Sea, set free from slavery, God told them, he said, now here's what I want you to do, guys. You've seen what I've done for you. Now here's what I need you to do. I need you to go and take the land. Remember that. Go and take. I need you to go and take the land. Now, I want to kind of translate this into our reality. You see, we've been given the same charge. We've been given the same charge. I want to read some verses to you. And these verses come from Jesus after he dies on the cross. He's resurrected. He gives his last words to us, his followers. And he says, now listen, I need you to make sure to get this. Because I just took you through the Red Sea. I brought you out of slavery. I set your feet on solid ground. You are now right with me because of the sacrificial work of Jesus. Now I've got a purpose for you. 
And that purpose matters. And then this is what Jesus said. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, don't miss this, go and make. See, he, he told them to go and take. Now he's calling us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey every, I've, everything I've commanded you. And I love this last part. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see, when Moses laid hands on Joshua when he was filled with the Spirit, you need to understand as a follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus also said this in that same moment that's recorded in Acts 1.8. He said, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Why? To be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of earth. You see, we've received the Holy Spirit of God. God's Spirit lives in you. The same Spirit that lived... And his warrior, Joshua, resides in you, not because of anything you've done, but because of the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ and your faith in who he is and what he's done. God has put his spirit in you for a purpose. I want to remind you of that today. Sometimes life can beat you up a little bit. Things can go wrong, and we forget what God has done and who we are in him. You are his child filled with his spirit for a purpose. Don't forget that. You have power. It's not power for your own benefit. It's power to accomplish the purpose of God. And the way that that power is ignited in our life is only through God's work. It's only through God's work. And here's the beauty of every person watching online and in this room. Everybody today that was at the Alico campus. Everybody today that gathered in here before you is we all uniquely have been gifted by God to do what God's called us to do. And when we collectively do that... That is dynamite. I don't want you to miss this, guys. This may be the most important thing I'm going to say in this message. You see, a no, an N-O, to God's go, always leads to wondering. Do you get that? Think about this. Go and take the land. Go and take. Okay, we're going to do it. Let's scope it out. Woo, that looks too much. They're too big. It's too hard. It's too great for God. That's in essence what we're saying when God tells us to do it. Right? It's just too big. We can't do this, God. And so, and so every time we say no to God's go, what was the result to the Israelites? Literally, they wondered for 40 years. Can I just say something to you? Could your wondering, could your wondering personally be because you're saying no to God's go it always results to that place every time all the time you see and God is telling us in essence the same thing I filled you with my spirit I've forgiven you through my son you're on the other side of slavery you're a free child of God now by the power of my spirit go go and make disciples can I just say maybe, maybe the reason the church in America, and I'm not trying to pick on one specific church, I'm speaking in general terms, has lost its way is because we're wandering in a spiritual wilderness because we've forgotten our purpose. We think church is about us. Listen, it's about the glory of God. You are part of an army. You're part of a family. And that family has a purpose to go and make disciples. You see, God has called us from go and take to go and make. He's called us from go and take to, to go and make. What will you, what will you give God? Will, will, will you continue to say, nope, they're too big, it's too hard, it's too great. Can I just be honest with you guys? When I think about what we're trying to do here, it's hard. Like I was praying about it this week. Construction costs keep going up. The challenges in front of us, I'm like, ah, oh, Lord, I need more faith. And I start to doubt God. And then I remember, no, 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 no. I'm with, I'm with a family of people who have the spirit of God, who have the call of God. We don't have a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power. Of power to accomplish God's purpose. He owns everything. He controls all things. 
He can stop the sun. He can bring hell down. He can do anything that seems like the enemy that stands in front of us creates a barrier. God can knock it down. He can move any obstacle that stands your way. And I just want to tell you that I don't know what that is in your life. I don't know what you're up against, but I want to remind you who God is. He's called you to more, but we've got to trust him. We've got to go from a no to a yes, because that no just keeps leading us into wondering. But when we say yes, there's breakthrough. When we say yes, there is clarity. What is it that God is calling you to? I've been asking this question all through this series, but is your yes on the table? Is your yes on the table? You know what, what makes, and we've got so many families in here, and I love that. What makes a family dynamic is not perfect people. Gosh, if you guys live with me, my wife probably wants to kick me in the face every week. It's, it's just people who are saying, God, we want to serve you. Our purpose is you. Whatever it is we do for work, wherever it is you call us, God, we want to make much of you. Our yes is on the table. We want to go and make disciples. We want to serve you. So what about you today? Right? So let's go back to our original example here, right? So for many of us, we have observational faith. We believe it's a chair. Looks like a chair. We believe Jesus is the Son of God. We say, yep. I believe that. I love the benefits. Heaven, that sounds great. But are we trusting in him? In your life, point blank, have you, have you gone from observing that Jesus is the Son of God to actually putting all of your trust in him? Now, can we just be honest? When, when I say that, I can, feel, I can even feel it in the room, right? I can feel like, I've done too much. It's too big. God can't forgive me. He knows the real me. Guess what? God made the sun stop. God can forgive you. God forgave me. God can forgive you. He wants to do that in your life. But you've got to put your trust in. You've got to put everything you have in who he is and what he's done. Have you done that in your life? Have you done that in your life? Here's what I want to do. I just want to help you do that. If you've never done that, I want to help you take that step. My primary goal in life, in my work, in my ministry, is to see people know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Why? Because religion ain't going to get you anywhere. Religion is man's attempt to climb a ladder to a dead-end road. You can't, you can't climb high enough, you can't do enough to get right with God in your own efforts. Christianity, Jesus followers... They are made right by the person and work of Jesus Christ. And how you get that is not by being good or not climbing a ladder. It's by actually surrendering and saying, Lord, I'm a slave to sin. I want freedom. I believe you are who you say you are. You can set me free from this sin that entangles me. You can make me right with you, not by my efforts, but by your gift of salvation through your work, through your resurrection. If you want that, I want to help you get that right now. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lead you in a response moment. Maybe you're watching online. You can do that right where you are. And here's the thing. Just regurgitating words with me will never make you right with God. Okay, I want to be so clear about that. It's faith. It's faith. And, uh, you know, if you've ever been in church for a long time, the old preachers used to say this. They used to say, do you feel that void in your heart? Do you feel that hole in your heart? And we used to kind of laugh about that. But isn't it so true? Like, isn't it so true? There is a void because you were created in the image of God. And without relationship with him, that void remains. But God has made a way to fill the void. To make us right with him. Is that void in your life? God wants to fill it today. Here's what I'm doing. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. Everybody watching online right where you are. And if today you want to begin that relationship with Jesus, you want to say yes to him and make him the Lord of your life, I'm the only one looking at you right now, okay? Just slip your hand up so I can see who you are and celebrate that with you. Anybody else? All right. Anybody else? All right. Awesome. Here's what we're going to do. We're just going to declare this prayer of faith right now. If you're comfortable praying with those who are praying for the first time, 
I want to invite you to do that. It's just an awesome moment just to declare God's grace and goodness. So let's pray this together. Father in heaven, I admit I am a sinner in need of your forgiveness. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross to remove my sin, my shame, and my guilt. I believe Jesus rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with you. Today I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I turn from my sin to be born again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is now my home. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's celebrate that today. Man, praise the Lord. If you just prayed that prayer to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to ask that you do uh, one thing for me and let us know by filling out a connection card, just the, the front, the contact information there on the front and on the back. Flip that over where it says, today I accepted Jesus. Check that, and then I'm going to ask that you drop this card in one of those metal boxes that are at the exit of this room. What we're going to do, we're going to follow up with you uh, this week. We'd love to be a resource for you. We'd love to come alongside of you as you begin your relationship with the Lord. And we have a gift for you out at the Resource Center. If you do not have a Bible, uh, we'd love to give you a Bible. And if you just started your relationship with the Lord, we have a book called Getting Started, which is going to be a great resource just to get you started as you begin your relationship with the Lord. So check that out. Those are uh, free of charge out there at the resource table. All right. And you'll notice for everyone in the room, uh, we've got a couple other uh, next steps as well as uh, prayer requests. If you fill that out, we've got a team that prays for those prayer requests each and every week. We'd be honored uh, to pray through anything that you'd share, uh, as well as uh, if you'd like to get more information about being baptized uh, and serving on a team, membership, etc. And this is something that I'm really excited about. You'll see on the back here, it says, send me more information about being a part of a small group. Well, we are about to kick off our small groups, and they're going to kick off the week of September 22nd. And today, as you leave here, we're going to hand you a list of all the different small groups available. We have a few more online as well, okay? And so this is an opportunity to join a small group. is an opportunity to meet some other people who also call Hope City home. They're great people and to grow in your relationship with the Lord. And here's the thing. It's a small uh, window of commitment, like six to eight weeks. So not really long, but it's going to be a powerful time. Uh, I believe that God's going to use it, use it as an, in a powerful way if you join a small group, all right? Uh, so what I want you to do is check that out as you get one of those uh, handouts on the way out. And then we have a table out in the lobby. And you, if you'd like, uh, we have a few people over there that can talk a little bit more about small groups. And one group, one ministry I'd like to highlight is what we call Grief Share. And if you have been uh, through a, a, a tragic season of losing a loved one uh, and kind of experiencing that grief, etc. We have a ministry called Grief Share uh, that we'd love to, to tell you about and get you plugged into. But that's going to help you process uh, that grief and, and just direct uh, your attention to uh, the gospel, the healing power of the gospel through that season. So check that out. That's out there as well. Uh, but I want to encourage you, get signed up for a small group. It's going to be an amazing time. And we're so glad that you joined us this morning. If you have a connection card, drop this in one of the metal boxes. And we look forward to seeing you next time. All right, take care.